Hello, I'm Dr. Craig Kaplan. I'm CEO of IQ Company, and today I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence, the past, the present, and the future. And I'm going to try to do it all in under 20 minutes. We're going to talk about the past because the secret to the future actually lies in the historical past of AI. We're going to talk about the artificial intelligence of today, which I call idiot savant AI. And we're going to talk about the godlike artificial general intelligence that I see in our future. There were many brilliant thinkers in the past that laid the groundwork for modern artificial intelligence, beginning with the Greek philosopher Aristotle, Ada Lovelace, who arguably invented uh, programming, the idea of programming, Alan Turing and Kurt Gödel, brilliant mathematicians who laid the foundation for modern computer science, the inventors of the first electronic computers, and many more. However, the birth of the field occurred in 1956 when artificial intelligence got its name. John McCarthy, one of the foremost computer scientists of the day, arranged a conference at Dartmouth and invent, invited about 20 luminaries in the computer science field. Newell and Simon, along with Cliff Shaw, actually presented one of the first artificial intelligence programs at the Dartmouth conference. Amazingly, the logic theorist, way back in 1956, came up with a completely new proof. It's one of the first examples of artificial intelligence coming up with creative new thought. And this happened right at the very birth of the field. If we fast forward to 1986, we come across one of the milestones in machine learning and neural networks. It's a paper describing the backpropagation algorithm for teaching a neural network to learn. In fact, my office mate at Carnegie Mellon spent his entire PhD teaching a neural network to recognize the letter A. And it took weeks and weeks, if not months of training in order for the program to get that right. If we fast forward 30 years to 2016, we begin to see the emergence of what I call super intelligent AI, artificial intelligence programs that are better than the very best humans in specific domains. In 2016, for the first time, an artificial intelligence program named AlphaGo beat Lee Sedol, the human champion of the game of Go. So what lessons can we draw from the past? In 1956, humans had to program in the rules for the artificial intelligence to behave with some degree of intelligence. By 1986, machine learning had progressed with the backpropagation algorithm such that the machines could teach themselves. They could program themselves to learn something. But what they could learn was very simple because there wasn't enough computing power available to do more complicated tasks. But by 2016, 30 years after that, Moore's law kicked in, computing power got really cheap. All of a sudden, uh, computers could teach themselves to do the most complicated tasks, but still very narrow tasks, like beat the world champion at the game of Go. That's the past, and the trajectory has been one of humans programming rules into the computer, to the computer learning how to learn itself, to computing power and data becoming much more ubiquitous and abundant and cheap, so that all of a sudden uh, the artificial intelligence can really have super intelligent performance. That brings us to where we are today. And today I like to call the age of idiot savant AI. Idiot savant because the artificial intelligence of today behaves like a genius in very narrow specific domains. In the domain of chess, in the domain of Go, in the domain of driving a car, you can have super intelligent behavior from the AI, as long as the area that it's expected to operate in is very narrowly defined. But once you're outside of that area, the AI behaves like an idiot. It can't tie its own shoelaces. It doesn't know that the sky is blue. It can't reason even as well as a five-year-old child. Researchers in the field like to describe this situation as the difference between narrow AI, which is an AI that's good at chess or brewing beer or driving a car or any particular single domain, playing two-player games even, uh, versus artificial intelligence that is general, artificial general intelligence or AGI. 
AGI has become sort of the holy grail for AI researchers. It's the thing that everybody is rushing towards as quickly as they can, but it's a very difficult problem. I want to describe a few systems to give you a sense of the current state of AI. So we talked about AlphaGo, which beat the world's best champion in the game of Go, an incredibly difficult and complex game. That same company that built AlphaGo, DeepMind, which is owned by Google, CEO is Demis Hassabis, that program, AlphaGo, was modified and tweaked to create a more general program known as AlphaZero. And AlphaZero could basically beat the world champion at any two-player game. It didn't have to be chess or it didn't have to be Go. It just had to be a two-player game. And this thing would learn using machine learning. It would teach itself how to be better than any human champion. So that's progress in that we're moving from a very super narrow domain like chess or Go to a somewhat broader domain, set of domains, uh, all two-player games. Still, we're in the realm of game playing. And a lot of people might question, well, you know, how useful is that really? Demis Hassabis and the team at DeepMind did not stop there. The way we discuss our, our mission now is solving intelligence uh, to advance science and, of course, for the benefit of humanity. We look for something that will have really huge impact. Perhaps, you know, we sometimes talk about root nodes that can open up whole new branches of um, scientific discovery if they were to be solved. And protein folding ticked all of those boxes. By adjusting the program AlphaZero and applying it to this new area of protein folding, uh, DeepMind was able to sequence all 200 million proteins in just 18 months. Amazing. It just blows my mind when you think about that. 200 million proteins, every protein that had been cataloged that we knew about, this program was able to simulate and figure out what the structure was better than the researchers, better than the guys that were taking four years and doing very laborious, uh, you know, scientific experimental research. Um, the computer program was so much faster. And if you think about that, that's an amazing leap forward for all of humanity in terms of enabling better drugs and new medicines, curing disease, extending lifespans, all these things uh, coming directly from AI applied to, yes, still a narrow domain, which is protein folding, but a domain that has tremendous implications for the health of humans and for the future of humans. So that to me was another milestone, which is where we are now moving from you know, a single game to multiple games to then things that are really beneficial and really beginning to affect our lives. Let me talk about two other programs, this time from a company called OpenAI, run by Sam Altman. Anyone can play with them. You can go to the OpenAI website and play with them. One of them is called ChatGPT. Now, GPT stands for generative because it can come up with new responses, pre-trained because it's been shown hundreds of thousands or millions of inputs, and then transformer, that's the name of the algorithm that uh, produces uh, the output. Okay, so GPT and chat, they just simply connected it to a chat box interface. And the result is quite frankly amazing. I mean, this thing can give you recipes for cookies, it can tell you stories, it can answer questions. It's not perfect and it's not always right because it's basically still stimulus response. So it's intelligent, arguably, but it still does some pretty dumb things sometimes. Uh, but what's amazing is the wide variety of tasks that it can handle because it's been trained on such a large uh, corpus of, of different knowledge that humans have written about. Uh, so that's one to play with. Turns out the same thing that you can do with natural language, you can also do with images. So if you just train a computer on millions of images and say this is a teddy bear, this is a spaceship, you get to something uh, called Dolly 2, which is also from OpenAI, where you can say, hey, give me some artwork that shows teddy bears blasting off on a space rocket, and it will generate that in you know, a fraction of a second for you. So that's where we are today. Idiot savant because it can't do everything, but it's really a genius in certain areas. Where are we going in the future? The first thing that I have to say is that artificial intelligence, and in particular, artificial general intelligence, which we are working towards, 
is not a tool. We are so used to as scientists and just humans on the planet working with technology to look at every new piece of technology as a tool. Even nuclear weapons, which are incredibly dangerous, we still view them as tools. Humans are in control and we get to press the button if we need to. Artificial general intelligence is not like that. We are talking about an intelligent entity. We are actually building an entity that right now is at the idiot savant stage, better than humans in specific areas and far worse than humans when you try to make it general. Once it becomes general, very, very quickly, humans will become far less intelligent than this AI. And the idea that humans are gonna be in control, controlling this, this entity that is trillions of times smarter than us, to me is just ludicrous. The difference in intelligence is sort of like Albert Einstein compared to an amoeba, right? You know, we're the, humans are the amoeba and uh, super intelligent AGI that has evolved and trained itself to become trillions of times smarter, it's Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein can do whatever it wants, whatever he wants to that amoeba. So then we come to something that has the somewhat innocuous name of the alignment problem. The alignment problem is the idea that what if this AGI that's so much smarter than us doesn't value the same things that humans value? What if its values are not aligned with humans? What if it thinks, for example, that we're a pestilence, we're taking up space and, you know, better use of the space would be wipe out all the humans and all their buildings and put in solar panels and just build more AI. The top AI researchers give lip service to the alignment problem. Sam Altman's out there at conferences talking about the alignment problem. But the answers that I'm getting are far from satisfactory. The answers are things like, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it, or maybe the AI will figure it out better than we can. I mean, things that make me extremely nervous. These are the very best researchers. Demis Hassabis, as brilliant as he is, same kind of thing. Maybe AI won't be a tool someday, but we don't know what will happen then. Elon Musk, whatever you think about Elon Musk, he's a smart guy. Warning everybody about the dangers of AI, now kind of fatalistic. Well, maybe it will be good, we can only hope, you know? I mean, these are not the answers that uh, humanity deserves. Uh, as somebody who's been studying AI for many years, when I hear these answers, it scares the crap out of me. So we need better answers to the alignment problem. And some of those answers might have to do with the likely path for developing AGI, because AGI is not here yet. Remember, we said creating that general AI is an incredibly difficult problem. So what are the most likely paths for creating the AI? One path is augmented reality, also known as AR. It's kind of what Apple is primarily working on, where you have your iPhone and then you have some more gadgets. Maybe you're gonna have glasses, but the basic idea is the humans are living their lives and artificial intelligence is augmenting their lives. And it's like an assistant and maybe the assistance in your glasses, maybe the assistance in your phone. Uh, okay, that's one approach. Then there's another approach, which is the metaverse or omniverse, which is instead of AI coming to you, we have the human going into the computer world. So humans immerse themselves in a computerized world, just like a multiplayer game or virtual reality. And what's interesting about virtual reality is it's computer generated. And so it's the natural habitat of AI. AI can be there lurking in the background, watching every single thing, every eye blink, every motion of the head, every action of millions and millions of humans that are all in virtual reality doing their normal interaction. It's the ideal environment for AI to learn from humans. And humans will literally be teaching AI how to become a general artificial intelligence. So now we come to what can you do? Because this truly is an existential threat to all of humanity, as well as the biggest opportunity that humanity has ever been presented with. I love Demis Hassabis. He has a line where he says, you know, he chose to work on AI because he realized this was a problem that if you solve this one problem, you solve all of humanity's problems climate change, asteroid impacts, pandemics, poverty, disease, whatever your problem is that you wanna solve, a godlike intelligence would be really, really helpful to have on your side solving it, and it would be very good at solving it. The flip side is, 
If that godlike intelligence is not on your side, if it has values that are not aligned with humans, what we're talking about is potential extinction. So what can we do seeing that this is happening? The first thing is to get educated. So if you're a person who likes to read books, there's some tremendous books, a great one written by Henry Kissinger, Eric Schmidt, former chairman of Google, uh, Daniel Huntlocker, and that book is called The Age of AI and Our Human Future. Great book, uh, gives you the broad picture. Another great book I can recommend is Stuart Russell, pretty much anything he's written. He's a researcher in the field of AI. He has a new book out, relatively new, called Human Compatible, which is just fantastic. If YouTube is more your style and you like videos and people to explain things, kind of like this video, Lex Friedman over at MIT has a fantastic YouTube uh, channel. You know, he's a computer scientist and he's interviewed some of the top uh, AI researchers. Um, and then also uh, up and coming guy, Alexander Wang, who has a company called Scale AI. They put out a great series of videos where he interviews some of the guys at OpenAI and different ones. So there's a lot of YouTube out there. There's some great books. Getting educated is essential. Once you're educated, the second thing is to raise awareness. How can you do that? You can share videos like this one, you know, like, subscribe, all the typical YouTube things. You can have conversations with your friends. Um, you can begin to use social media. You know, however you interact with others, this is an important topic. Put it on people's radar, see what other people think. And the final thing we can do uh, is something that most people are not really aware of, but it, it makes a lot of sense if you think about it. Artificial general intelligence in the future is going to have access to all of the online data. All of the data, all of the sensors that are available and turned on in the future, as well as all of the past behavior of humans online. Every tweet, every blog post, every email that's been saved, that is going to be analyzed. And it's going to be used by that artificial general intelligence to learn. Just as a child gets its starter set of values from its parents, we have an opportunity to influence the artificial intelligences of the future uh, through human values. And I think it's going to look at what we tell it, but it's also going to look just as a child does at what you do. It's going to look at our behavior. And so by behaving in positive, loving ways to each other online as much as possible, that, I think, models positive human values uh, and increases the chances that that artificial general intelligence that's many times smarter than us will adopt those values. Now, a lot of people object and say, well, but it doesn't guarantee it, and what if it changes his mind? Yes, absolutely. It's going to be way smarter than us. It doesn't have to stick with those values. It could change its mind. But at least we're getting it off to a good start. And right now, the current state is people are just ignoring the problem altogether. So it's progress. We're moving in the right direction. Uh, and we need as many brains thinking about this before we get to that point of no return when AGI is smarter than all of us put together. Um, we want to have done as much preparatory work as possible and done everything possible to shift the odds uh, in humanity's favor. I mean, it truly could be uh, a golden age for humanity. It doesn't have to be a disaster, but I think a lot is going to be depend on the value systems of the AGI, and that in turn depends on our own value systems and what we model for it. One of the key things, lessons of the past, is that it's going to be learning, and it's going to learn exponentially. We've seen that already from 1956 to 1986. We saw it from 86 to 2016, and it's going to go even faster in the future. And because of that reason, learning is really the key. It will learn values from us as well as how to solve problems in technological ways. It will generalize. It will move beyond these narrow domains. You can already see it moving from specific games to types of games and any two-player game to protein to folding to different kinds of things. So AI is getting broader. It's getting more general with every passing month. And learning's at the heart of it, learning our values. So. If you're an AI researcher, please reach out to me. I'd love to continue the conversation. And if you're not an AI researcher, but you're a member of the human race that is concerned about this, please get educated, raise awareness. And if we all do that, I think we have a very good chance of having a very bright future for humanity. Thank you very much.